Hey, Frodo. Hello, the Swede. Hi, Frodo. Hello, Peter. Good to resurface. What's that? Good to be able to resurface. Yeah, you've been uh, busy, but um, that's what happens. And um, yeah, good. I'm glad you're taking care of your parents, and we're very, very grateful for your contributions here. So be here when you can, no stress. Uh, thanks a lot. Much appreciated. Good, good. So, Peter, in these calls, we don't really focus on visual meta anymore because it's boring. Only because we've nailed down 1.1 and ACM is doing what they can. So we're trying to go a little bit further, just uh, thinking widely. And we have an idea for, no, we don't have an idea for, we have an idea that on the 9th of December, which is Doug's demo anniversary, of course, we should show something because I'm presenting with uh, Vince and Ismail at the summit of the book. Oh, very good. So something may or may not happen, but um, that's kind of the, the, the what we're looking at, isn't it, uh, Adam? And why don't you, Adam, because we have different perspectives, but interesting overlaps. Why don't you just talk for a while, even if it's just waffling, uh, just to see what comes out. On any particular of it, topic? Oh, yeah, well, uh, okay. Um, let me give you another one minute intro then. <laughs> um, next year is, um, oh, Mr. Anderson is here. Good. Hey, Mr. Anderson. So I was oh, just, uh, just about to start something. I was just about to say uh, it was Bruce Horn's birthday yesterday. Talked to him the day before. Bruce Horn wrote the original finder on the Macintosh. He worked at Xerox Park. Steve Jobs came by and he went to Apple. So he was my first friend in the field who took me seriously. So I love and adore him. I'm very grateful for his um, perspective. So he said that next year is the anniversary of Smalltalk, uh, some kind of a big anniversary. Oh. I don't remember which. And he worked on Smalltalk with Alan Kay. Alan is, of course, here in London. And uh, that was all very nice. And maybe we'll do something together. I don't know. But he said that what he had made clear when he was invited to be part of the thing is that right now climate change is existential for our species he feels that university research should have to be 50 percent absolutely focused on climate change that's what he says i don't think universities are good enough for that but that's his strong position so when it comes to augmenting what we do is his in his mind it has to be towards that so let's just wait for brendan i'll do a 10 second recap hi brendan Hello. How was hey, it? Good. good to see you again. I was just um, telling the guys really briefly, I had a chat with Bruce Horn earlier this week, original Mac developer, as in made the Mac. And he is working on um, something for the Small Talk anniversary next year. And he says that in his mind, climate change is so serious now. All university research, at least 50% of it should be climate related. And if we're going to do any augmentations, he feels it should be climate related. I'm not saying that we in this community necessarily should do that, but I am saying that as we think wider than visual meta, because that's closed for now, it's done, which is good for now. Uh, when we think about stuff, I don't think we should just think uh, demo. And this is me preaching to the choir, by the way. I don't think I'm saying anything in disagreement with you, just for clarification. And it also shouldn't just necessarily be about a capability without the capability actually being useful. That was his perspective, and I think I agree to an extent. And Adam has had many, many ideas. So just before you guys popped in and I started this little thing, that was the request for Adam to talk a bit. Yeah, Frodo tried to put me on the spot and hold a five minute uh, speech on, uh, on nothing. Well, just to see what comes out, because you know, you have, um, so many different perspectives and we're trying to loosen things up a little bit so yeah uh, regard, uh, regarding climate change in a way i agree with him it's uh, the number one priority for for humanity right now or yeah health and environment is should be number one always yeah. um and yeah and mental well-being uh, as well yeah oh 
Yeah. Sorry, uh, we had a negotiation this morning. Edgar didn't want to go to camp, so he was promised to have popcorn and that he could watch Hamilton. So, <laughs> a little popcorn coming in. Edgar, I have to finish with my continue with my meeting. Do you going to go with mommy, or do you want to sit here and listen? You can do that. Go with mommy. I'll go with mommy. Okay. All right. Sorry. Why, I'll pause. Wise for choice. <laughs> I go with popcorn any day. <laughs> All right. The okay, fans have spoken. <laughs> Um, but still here in our community, even though climate change is uh, maybe the, yeah, or other existential th threats, uh, maybe the biggest risks to humanity, we need to still uphold what, uh, what is really great about humanity and uh, humans. And, uh, and I think our sharing of knowledge is one of those things and uh, and uh, that can be uh, done much better and we, we have just started that process i think whenever i look at my physical text and the texts that appear everywhere in real life in physical space i see that so many things are missing in our digital text that we we can't stop here just because we have climate change i think climate change require or many things many of the big questions require better better tools to be to make her more intelligent and smarter and really understand things well and uh, um, so we must do both we can't uh, put uh, put this as an either or thing or uh, it we, ma we must fix text and our sharing of knowledge we must fix education because many of the things with climate change is related to education that we don't really see the consequences of our actions fully enough because when you do that, you start you start changing. Not everyone, but many people start changing when they really see the consequences. So um, I see. I think we are on the right track. <laughs> and there, my speech <laughs> was cut off by the producers. <laughs> I got my three minute slot. That was my first. Uh, uh, let's start there, Frodo. Yeah, um, Brendan, you are newish. So, you know, we, we all agree here that we need to augment how we think through our media. Today, there was somebody on Twitter posting this guy who says, uh, lawyers, Peter, I'm sure you will agree, they cannot think before they write. They have to think with writing because it's too complex what they are thinking about. So they need that extra augmentation, which was great. Put it on my thesis. But Brendan, what's your perspective? Yeah, that's uh, Adam. It's great take. Um, I see the same uh, as I look at like the most severe serious charging problems that we're facing um, the underlying kind of foundation of not having a, a solid platform to talk the same language in uh, that's that's an outrageous problem that we need to solve so when I see the advances that people are making in the world of text to, to make uh, well exportable interoperable text from program to program or the way that we share and build knowledge together uh, those are some of the most pressing things that i can imagine i can help with today in my life um, and it ties in with the research project that i'm working on actually uh, around discourse graphs uh, because there's a way to accelerate learning it's a hypothesis but there's a way to accelerate learning for experts in fields that they don't know about if we can provide a better kind of sight line towards what's already been published where that claim is coming from the evidence that's behind it etc so i really love that perspective adam um, and admittedly kind of it's it's more accessible for me to solve a massive problem like climate change or like uh any of the other societal issues that come up through a lens of like that foundation that is on the uh, knowledge building, synthesis, and sharing side. Forgive okay. me on the noise. I'm in oh, I'm yeah. in uh, Chicago, and it's air and water show weekend. So there are. <laughs> I got a fighter jet that just flew above my my apartment. I apologize oh. for that background noise. Oh, uh, right. yeah, Peter. The Blue Angels. I yeah, think. Yeah, they're they're coming later today. I think. I think one thing that would be close to our ambit would be addressing the shift from following links on the web to being overly dependent upon Google search engines where, okay, 
I don't see it locally, but we have these massive server farms and for everything, even the most trivial things, what do we default to? We default to search through the whole corpus of indices of everything that's ever been put on the internet anywhere, which is absolutely nuts. We should be working on focusing people to directed index pages and let them follow links to get to what is really relevant first and not depend so heavily on megacorp based search engines doing brute force indexing of our knowledge for us. And that could probably reduce an awful lot of heat that's being pumped out. Just the, the heat's hidden. It's not my little laptop that's causing the problem. It's all these massive megacorps that have redirected things so that all of the energy use is at their global corporation scale. And of course, that also prevents better alternatives from coming along because everybody just defaults to, I'll use Google or I'll use Bing. And we're not looking at better, more efficient ways to find what we need to know. And of course, it's great for the megacorps where, okay, we'll get everybody to think that the only answers are machine learning AI, which depends on massive data sets that only they control, or massive global level search, because of course, again, they have the indexes and for anyone else to try to go start spidering the whole world to build an alternative index isn't gonna be feasible. So it's great, they love it. They get us dependent upon technology that can only operate at megacorp scale. And that's pushing out innovation where it could be much more space, time and energy efficient, distributed over networks of people who have commonalities of interest where it could be much more efficient and saving. So working at helping to improve our knowledge access by getting away from the machine learning search engine paradigm is something that we have the expertise to help steering people to do. It would have a ripple effect on the climate, but trying to take it on head on, I don't think there's anything we could do that would make a dent. But indirectly, through where our expertise is, maybe just shifting the orientation of where computing is taking place a little bit, that could have a much bigger impact and just take a little bit longer to ripple through the system. I think Mark has a. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, in a sense, Peter's part picks up, but it reminds me of when I was doing a stint up as, assisting one of the ministries. And, you know, every time I said, oh, well, we'll just get some AI. I said, well, have you, where's the line in your you know, plan for the cost? You know, greenhouse gases, all the server farms in the background. To which the answer was, well, that's unhelpful. It's a sort of la, 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 I can't hear you approach to life. Which is which is absolutely farcical. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with these technologies, but we, they become a lazy prop for the for the intellectually weak, I think. And we're not we're not really using them in the way that we should. Um, the other thing I, I thought I'd raise, <clears throat> moving things out a bit wide, more widely in terms of interchange, was one of the things I've been reflecting on this week. And it's all right, Fred. The book's upstairs, so you don't have to see it. But I'm really something called a, a place for everything, which is a bit of a curate's egg. It, it's a really interesting tale. Uh, but really badly edited. Um, but it's sort of about the history of how we came to have indexes and citation and sorting. And I think the thing that I've really internalized from that was some, you know, explained that actually alphabetical sorting isn't logical. It used to be sorted by holy words, you know, then animals, the trees, you know, things that people understood. And in a, in a then basically memory-based verbal culture, things like alphabetical sort, you actually, you know, people actually had to explain what it meant. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that's something we we forget. And I'm minded in terms of thinking widely about the future of text is, you know, the missing voices in the room. Um, a lot of the technical end of things has basically emerged in uh, an English speaking uh, language environment where, you know, we have no complexity. We don't even have any, any accented characters. Um, and also a fairly cult, a fairly narrow cultural view, mainly from one theistic point. And I, you know, I, I was I, I must reminded that you go and look in a different sort of cultural perspective. You not only see different languages and stuff, but you 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 see subtlety uh, as of different ways of looking at the same thing. Um, and that's what I'm. I don't know what it, I mean, to me, it's an unknown, un, un, or sorry, it's a known unknown. <laughs> I know I don't know about it, and I question you more. Um, and it's, you know, it, even to the extent that I was just um, reflecting on the fact that having, I, I did a sort of talk, before I did my PhD, I did a talk Masters in Web Science where people were, were loudly proclaiming, this is interdisciplinarity. And I thought, no, it's not, it's just dogs and cats locked in a room together. There wasn't really any interchange between the arts and the sciences, science, sciences, except being together. 
And, you know, for a lot of the arts people, it was just doing arts on a computer, uh, if I'm being cynical. Um, and the sad thing was that, for instance, when you look at the history of citation, sort of the arts and sciences actually use citations for a very different purpose. And it's nothing to do with the format. Uh, you know, that, that, that stuff is, is, is a trivia on top. But when you step back and then you think about some of the things we're thinking about here and the interchange of information, it's to what purpose? And that's also quite hypertextual. You know, in the early days of hypertext, people were actually thinking about why you're linking to something, not just a link. Um, and that also neatly feeds around to the idea we're, we're having the visualizations and what we're trying to do with data so that you can begin to see those nuances of interaction between things. And, you know, in an indirect way, this should all feed into the scholarship that needs to be applied to address some of the big uh, social problems like, you know, um, climate things. I have a big yellow hand today. Um, yeah, just just two things. One of them is, um, you know, as we go away from visual meta, I also want to propose we do the opposite, which is imagine everything having every single thing having visual meta attached when it's copied. So if you copy an event from your calendar to give it to someone else, it has the formatting of all the context it could possibly have. So that's semi throwaway sentence statement. But we talked um, last week a little bit about calendar and diary and that kind of stuff. I'm wondering if the group feels like we should think some more about that because time is a natural organizer. Uh, and if you combine time with location, you can get something really powerful. Like, you know, calendars today are, of course, absolutely awful going back. You know, on, on a normal Mac, why do you have photos and library and uh, sorry, calendars, two separate apps? It could be the same thing. You know, when you read an article, it could be stored as well as when you write an article. So you have your history and you have you know, all this stuff could come together and it's been discussed in groups on and off for years and years and years. But I'm wondering if we're going to focus on some kind of useful wow thing for, let's say, the 9th of December, what kind of thing are, are, are you guys thinking about? What would you like to build? I'm, I'm just going to say that I, I do think we, we, we need to retain a sense of practicality because Rather, in, rather on the same line of, well, let's just stick it on a server that somebody else pays for, you know, and produces tons of heat and all that sort of thing, is that um, I think we need to draw some line between um, writing, do, doing something of reasonable note, writing an article, producing a, you know, a plan for the company or something, as opposed to writing by pet food. Because the load of metadata can become irrationally large uh, and i know it's easy to say oh but if we had all this we could do stuff but i i think we need to be slightly disciplined in improving to ourselves that we do actually need that otherwise it becomes it becomes actually yet another aspect of big data well if we connect enough stuff i think well, i think we've solved that mark especially with the to a large extent because of the like the errata page and stuff like that so even with visual meta, just to use that as an example, th there is one page that is creator made. That should probably always stay, but the other pages can be pruned at any time. Right, so just, but, but Mark, let's not go down a rabbit hole of, of that because then we're kind of back on that specific topic. But what, what do you guys actually want to consider building? Because my head is very building based. I'm wondering how you feel. Timeline, calendar, connecting texts. Time. It's right. the most underrepresented and the most poorly represented of all our analytical techniques. But it runs through so many things that we do. And in fact, we invest vast amounts of effort in sort of building proxies for time, which is actually the sort of thing we know about it. Um, so I that's my two pen of Mark, could you elaborate on that? You know, the, yeah, the proxies um, for time specifically. Well, 
yeah, I, I, a lot of things happen along a timeline and, and you know I think we were talking one of the chats the other day about you, you often sort of say oh you know what was something yes I two weeks ago or you, you sort of know roughly often one of the ways you access stuff in here is on along along a timeline and actually quite a lot of what we do is along a timeline um, it might be uh, something you're doing personally it might be say something you're writing for the the public or private sector thing that you work in and there are steps, there are uh, clear times in it where events of, of note happen. And it actually part of the problem of today's affordances is, is we think it doesn't matter. And in fact, then we're back and rather what Peter mentioned, where we have to search everything to get to the thing that we roughly know where it is, but we never bother to build the thing that actually gets us to where we know it is. So actually having things that allow you to look at things a longer time would be remarkably useful. A problem with it is it's visually very messy because what tends to happen is things are massively lumpy. So you, that implies you, uh, you sort of need to have some quite dynamic filtering. But, but that, that to my mind involves techniques and things that we broadly understand. It's just, it hasn't, it hasn't been brought together in terms of the time being the primary axis. It doesn't matter whether you draw it up, up the page or across the page or whatever, the relational page, um, but it's the primary axis. So what you're moving when you move through the state of space is you're changing in time. Things happen at a certain point. Um, and that just isn't there. It may be ironically because thus far, a lot of our visualization work has actually been static. It's a fixed thing. <laughs> times are rather hard <laughs> to put into a static diagram, um, partly because it's really lumpy. So you end up with a mass massive amount of um, deliberate elision just, just to make the thing readable. Whereas dynamically, we can sort of filter that out. But it is just the thing, I mean, the, the one that was sticks in my mind was when I was sitting up in, in London government, so I was saying, okay, right. So you're saying what you want to be able to do is to say, um, who are the people involved in draft 16 of that treaty, which you know is about nine months ago? You should be able to scrub back to that time, look at the document population then, filter by the people you know were involved in it, because if you keep a long, longitudinal track of everyone who has, say, an access to that system, you, you know who the superset of people who might be involved in. So you, you can begin to crank down, and even if somebody never bothered to write this version of the never ending Google Doc, this version that I'm writing now is an important milestone. It might be a novel you're writing, it might be something else, but it's the same general principle. Um, and the, uh, which, which leads to one other observation I'll shut up, which is that the other thing we, we're not very good at is making the metadata affordances to record those important temporal moments because we're used to leaning on the computer in the naive belief that the computer actually knows what we're thinking. It can tell us when something was saved. So you can scrub right through a Google Doc for, for through a 20 year life. It'll let, it'll let you produce any edit you want. What it won't tell you is which edit was, was significant. Does that help? Our tools are based on absolute time and the way we think is event relative time. Mm. Now, one area where that would be incredibly helpful is my programming. I can't tell you how many times I've started down one path, then had to switch off to another project and then wind up reinventing something that I did in the past. And I can't quite get back to the earlier version of it that had the content that I'm looking for. It's incredibly frustrating because the file names, just by the very nature of computer software have massive overlap and similar replicated patterns across documents. Uh, that's partially why I find literate programming so attractive, but all the literate programming tools that are currently out there are basically absent user interface on top of them. So they're dependent upon you're going into the document and using your little at fragment name and your little at brace and at close brace and annotating with that, then running them through tools that really aren't designed to be extensible. You can, I mean, you have all the source code of the tool. It's even a literate program, so you can figure out how it worked, but they weren't designed to be extensible. It's not like a Visual Studio Code workspace 
where someone else can come and create a plugin to make the tool more useful in a slightly different direction. Um, as a result, I wind up having to reinvent the wheel a lot of times when I really shouldn't have to. If I'm lucky, it'll be a project that I did have the time to invest in doing the literate programming style for it. And then I'll go and I'll read my literate programming web and it'll bring me right back up to where I was in no time. The trouble is for a lot of quick and dirty projects, the overhead of starting the literate programming setup for it and putting in the templates and getting everything working is too high. So when I was working on them, I didn't realize it was going to be something I was going to have to come back to. So I didn't use literate programming for it, even though in retrospect, I should have. But at the time, I didn't know it was going to be something that I needed to be using that layer on top of. So literate programming plus time and some metadata could be a real interesting sweet spot. And if we built something that could be used by the programming community, that could have second order leverage effects all across the board, just the kind of rich augmentation stuff that Doug was all about. Thoughts on yeah. As I return to my coffee. <laughs> I, I, just, I just want to add to the discussion that, um, um, okay, so at heart, I am a child who likes to build with Lego blocks. So that, you know, I'm that, that's what I do. So here are some things that just popped into my head this week. For trying to plan a meeting with a friend. Uh, in a normal calendar, why can you not do things like click a button to take a screenshot of a day without showing what the events are, just blocked out, and just send that? That would be useful, right? How about being able to click a button so you're in a mode with a cursor or a select? So you go click all the different free times you want to meet someone. And you click on an email text message, and it turns it into text. So those are the days, right? That could be useful. Actually, organizing a meeting is something that people have tried to do for decades and decades, with agents and all kinds of stuff, right? There are so many things. And also, on, there, are, there are OK calendars like Fantastical, which shows a little bit of integration. But in my perspective, they're kind of ugly, which is part of it. The, the joy isn't really there. But imagine if you can, like we talked about last week, imagine if you have, you keep this layout, you have columns for days, but then the rows, you can put absolutely anything you like. So one column and row could be just your meetings. Another one could be weather, if you want. Another one could be Bitcoin values. You know, another one could have been recordings from our meetings here. It, it, it's so easy because time is a universal thing, at least if we use UTC. So you know where things go, photographs from where you've been. If you extract from your phone locations where you've been, all of that can be there and also for the future. I think we could derive something very useful from that. And I think for the kind of stuff Adam's been doing, if he has access to these coordinates, you know, we can build, I mean, imagine turning that into a globe view where you not only have yourself mapped, but you have other things happening in the world at the same time. Imagine if you compress that like crazy because you've imported a timeline for, let's say, the history of text, which we're working on. So you can then see the start and end of specific periods of time. And you can see, I was doing this, you know, what iPhone was available. That was the era of this iPhone, which is something you're interested in or not. If you go even further back in history, you can have this is during the Renaissance, you know, all the little things. And then you can go entirely the other way and go into atomic time if you want to, almost from a teaching perspective, you know what I mean? It's like if you start putting things on the timeline, almost anything can go there. Mm -hmm. it, it's quite provocative. Put a, I put a pink hand up at the top. <laughs> see. I, I sort of get that, but I can't help slightly feeling where we're smushing together a quite personal scope with the more exploratory scope. Yeah. Um, and the date, yeah, but the sort of, I, then there's an awful lot of distillation to do. I mean, I, I think on the, on, the, on the wider level, absolutely, if I want to look at things and what was going on, um, I find meeting planning odd. I mean, I think if I have an observation, there's two things. Is one is we massively overvalue our own time. And, and as a corollary, we tend to undervalue other people's time. So, you know, that we mean well, we actually do things to our personal satisfaction. Um, and, 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 you know, at the same time, some people are much more um, 
it's sort of in demand as it were than others so there's no one size fits all yeah. but i i wonder if if you know the one thing the world really needs is better time planning i'm i'm i, I am to be convinced of it no, the, it's the not that it can't be made better but i think there are bigger fish to fry the, the, the future stuff, that, that, that was a little detail. I'm just saying, from my perspective, I can't help myself. That's the kind of thing I think about. Sure, I'm sure, sure you guys all think in similar ways. You know, I, I am more thinking about the history stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, just imagine if you have a, a grid view and it's an app, so it's normal thing people install. People can choose, because already, of course, you can subscribe to calendars. Some people have, um, you know, holiday calendars and all of that. Why can't we go further? Why can't we have... Um, our own APIs, like on the Mac, there's a lot of stuff that's available, but it's not integrated. But also imagine, for instance, an author, if I were to develop the ability to save every time you do a, a spot save by quitting or whatever, the changes are put in a database that is time based. So you can actually choose to have a, a, a box in your timeline, you can see where when you wrote what in a document. But are we again being over dependent on computer telling us, i.e., that we're, and we're back in the world of big data? I, I don't know. It's just something in me says that can't we take more human agency, and rather because I, I just think we 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 Sorry, I just things keep that. tend to spiraling oh, out oh, into. Working, let's build a better software. Mute, Mark, what? I'm just joking and pretending I'm trying to mute you. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's one thing. But OK, so today we got a letter in the mail saying that we owe a council lots of money because we haven't paid a parking ticket. We, we never received that ticket. Right. So what's the first thing I do? I go to that date in my calendar and try to figure out what we did that day. Right. There were, and that's that was important just for a few minutes today, but also within what we're doing here. Wouldn't it be really useful to have a, a, a history? I mean, particularly I, I, when I can, when I'm at a stable with reader and author, I really want to make a little app we all put on our systems, records our voices in these meetings, and we have the ability, like we talked about last week, if something interesting that someone says, you tap a keyboard thing, and it tags that bit of time, so that when you go back, you don't have to listen to the whole gosh darn thing. Just to make that available to us. I know Microsoft and all these companies have research projects for all of that, but it seems to me a lot of stuff that can happen if we have a really open environment for it can just simply be useful. And we're talking about machine learning at the beginning. The APIs that Apple have given us for especially the M1 machines are insane. You know, we don't have to use data centers or anything like that. We do it locally. But, you know, that, that's what's really exploding, the edges. So if we, yes. if we want to do amazing magic, we can do it on our own machines. But we're trading our data for free use of other people. So, I mean, the thing is, it's not really free. I mean, it's around, but as we know, this is the whole thing. We, you know, we're providing it because someone else is making money on the scale, and which is fair because they're running the expensive servers in the background. The way no, no, not, no, 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 not, um, not, it's not how the world should no, be. But Mark, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about servers. I'm talking about there's a lot of machine learning that can do, be done on the device without going to servers. Now, of course, it needs to be trained on a data set. There's no question, and that's not brilliant. But when you look at what's available that Apple just give out, like extraction of features, uh, all kinds of stuff in video, and then there's audio, speech to text, all available, all for free. Mm. Even if well, I mean, just... you can dictate now, it's just we just use what's freely available. But what can this community, just by using our imagination, stretch that to the next level? What would be absolutely amazing? Bro, you hit on something earlier with regards to. Uh... I believe it was you thinking through writing and kind of needing, needing that aspect. And it was the quote on lawyers. Um, I often think that through uh, speaking, my, my best thoughts kind of come out. It's usually in a conversational form um, in a group like this or uh, with a trusted friend. And that concept of almost the, the, the down arrow, hitting the down arrow to save off something of note or you know, shift eight. And, and you have an asterisk all of a sudden in conversation because you said that better than you could ever put it into words in, in written form. That's rather neat. That feels like magic. That that feels like you're, you're getting at something that relates specifically to text. I would like to press a button for exactly what you just said to go back yeah. 15 seconds before that. Have that in a way that maybe goes to YouTube so we can cite it. Yeah. Yeah. 
it, it should be possible in our community to build that and not as a demo, but as in a really viable product, right? That's super, super simple. But also the, the key thing that, you know, it, it, the Doug stuff was always about collaboration. And now these days, for good reasons, I have to start thinking about libraries. It should be done not for your own personal knowledge space only. Of course, you can use it privately if you want, but we really need to think of how we can share that. Mm. I mean, imagine if we have a meeting here and we have five different recordings going on. We have five different people choosing what's important, let's say. At the end of it, technically, it should be trivial to have a report generated in a PDF if you want, or HTML, whatever, something normal and basic with the summary of the bits that people think is important that we can easily sort through and see if there's an overlap. Click on it to see, to get to the audio or click on it to expand the, the whole text. All of that crap should be super easy, right guys? For the user. I think it's also thinking about, and again, thinking about reading about the, the arrival of sort of alphabetical sorting has made me think about, well, you know, so let's take a ridiculous example. If I've just arrived from some other alien planet and I don't know the human alphabet for toffee, so I say to them, I want to see all the yellow books. How easy is that? Um, in other words, just I think we need to think more widely about uh, it's in our na nature to sort of collect the things that we're familiar with. And I wonder, I wonder if we're sort of thinking through that enough. I mean, I don't know the answer. I, I, my, my, my definite drift in recent months has been to move far away from the norms and start to think about thinking, well, what are the other things I can put in juxtaposition that are going to lead me to an, um, uh, an insight? And more to the point, an insight that a machine will never have because it's not a pattern, because we haven't defined it as a pattern yet, but do the thing that human brains are actually rather good at which yeah. is drawing these links. Um, and so I sort of look at a lot of the things you're mentioning in terms of how do they increase serendipity, I guess is the, the shorthand way of it. I don't, I don't you, you can't force serendipity. Um, you can put all the right things in the right place and so nothing magical may happen. Um, and I think, but that's as much as it's fair to hope for, but I think it's a good, it's a good thing to do because we have machines to do all the rest. We sort of know how to do that, and they're getting all the work well. But, but collectively, as humans, I think we're putting way too much intellectual effort into that. Far too many bright people are wasting their time on something that will get better when they probably should be actually doing things like you mentioned at the outset, about thinking about things like climate change are going to bite us much more quickly. Um, Adam? Um. Well, it's kind of a devil advocate thing here. Um, and for the last many years, I've been uh, doing imp improvised drama, teaching it and playing it. And uh, and uh, and there you play a real play or a, an, in, an invented play for uh, one and a half, two hours where you don't know anything. A group like us five would go up on stage and not knowing uh, any single line and we wouldn't know who we were and nothing. Everything is really invented uh, along the way. And, and nothing was ever saved there. Everything was in the moment, invented in moment and lost in the moment. And the audience were there, we were fully present. And, uh, and there, were, uh, there is a kind of a tradition of never recording anything nothing so you have nothing it's uh, basically drawing in the sand so, so you're left with impressions but not the actual art piece because it's uh, you move through it rather than saving you can't really save it and uh, even watching it later on can uh, so you know and also for meetings like this i'm a bit restricted in the recorded format i know that this will be saved uh, forever and i changed my personality a bit uh, uh, compared to being in a room with you and just be, uh, being crazier, sillier, uh, more out there, t taking greater risks uh, in what I'm saying, not offending people, not uh, uh, I can take far greater risk in person when I really see the reactions and I, I trust people fully and I trust the, the wider. That is actually but a very important concern. Yeah, 
you can't really say anything here recorded and uh, you don't want to insult someone or, uh, or well uh, you, you, we as we sometimes do we can pause the recording for times yep but the, it's still a, the, it's a big requirement to ask for you to pause the reco uh, recording while, while i um, yeah um, well, it's, it's it's knowing that you're going to have a moment of insight sufficiently for, <laughs> to ask for the recording to be paused. <laughs> I have a good thought. Please pause the recording so we can... No, I mean, it's interesting that you feel that. I, I, as the kind of moderator here, I don't feel it would be a problem for me to pause at all. But the fact that you feel that is important. But also, there are different stages. You know, I would very much like to sit and have cognac or whatever with you guys and coffee in the middle of the night and talk all kinds of crazy shit. But that's a very different stage of, you know, kind of putting something together. And when it comes to putting something together, it's, it is a more sober experience. There's no question about that. And it's also an experience that, um, for instance, what I was going to put in the box here is when someone is speaking, if a keyword comes up that you or someone else has mentioned before, maybe it shows up on the side of the screen so we can quickly go back and see what we talked about before. You know, it's a, it's a kind of a navigational environment. Right, because we're trying to define a space, we're trying to make something useful. Um, so building the thing we're talking about, I don't think it precludes what you're talking about. I think it would be totally fine if we said every Monday or this special Friday or whenever it is, no recording, uh, not, maybe not even video, whatever we want. We as humans mustn't be slave to just doing it automatically the same way and everything is a record. You know, I had a, a situation recently where I posted something on Twitter and then I got a swearing at a British politician and I got someone else coming that I'm associated with within 10 minutes saying, this is not really the right kind of language. And I deleted it immediately and I had to, and I'm grateful that I knew then because as we move through life, we forget opportunities. It's so easy to be slagged off based on what we said before. Really important point, Adam. I see Peter has his hand up. Yeah, the yellow book story actually reminds me of some horrible experiences trying to relocate material at the law library back when I was in law school. And there was a case, for instance, there was a book that came in as a new book in the fall semester of my first year of law school. And I didn't have time to really go through it at the time, but I made a mental note that you know, this was a large red leather bound book. It was somewhat oversized and had a lot of prologue source code in it. And it was you know really interesting conference proceedings then you know like a year and a half later i was trying to relocate and i said well it came in that it, can you tell me where it is in the library and the librarians were at a complete loss and i said well okay but i know it was a new book in the fall of yeah exactly 89 mm -hmm. and i said well and i said that data has to be in the system somewhere i said well yeah but it's not a searchable field so that did me no good. Well, what about the fact that it was an oversized, large red leather volume? Well, no, those physical characteristics of the covers aren't recorded. Okay, but it's got to be under prologue. Well, as it turns out, when I accidentally found the book a few months later, just by poking around in the stacks, it wasn't indexed anywhere under prologue. And it was named after the city that the conference was in. So then the Milan proceedings of such and such. Nothing anywhere in the title or metadata in that library catalog entry indicated there was anything related to computer source code in it, let alone prologue in particular. And it was so frustrating. I said, well, can't we just annotate the record? And it's like, oh, no, we have established procedures. We get our records catalog records from union catalog and we can't push data back upstream because you know you wouldn't want to risk something that wasn't accurate getting in and i would rather have an erroneous piece of metadata attached by a third party where okay i can come in later on and say well no actually this bit of metadata was wrong and yeah. not have the metadata be there and have no way to search it yes uh, yeah i remember you mentioned that story that's frustrating uh mark no, I, I was just thinking, and because I, I know it always causes confusion when I, you know, people say, well, don't you annotate a lot? And the answer is I don't menu because my, my sort of annotation mentally is quite visible and we, there isn't a written form for it. You know, I do remember things. So it's on the right hand page three quarters of the way through the book. Um, and I keep wishing I could have a indexing system that just used the book cover. I'd be very happy if, if there was metadata that showed the covers of other versions of the book, but the one that I have, be it an e-book or a real book. And I was just thinking, I think there are now 
mm, 14 bookcases in this house and I'm getting to the point where I'm trying to remember where stuff is. Um, and it's sort of frustrating. Um, you can't have it all to hand. Um, but the whole point I do that is, is I couldn't do that if it was all e electronic. It would just never get looked at. Because oh, I find it, electronic recall just never seems to work for me. Right. Was that an octopus book or was it a squid book? I, <laughs> I remember that it was. <laughs> okay, well, when, we, when we move into digital native stuff, mm. you know, there will be different navigational requirements. One of them is time. You know, when because mm. it, it why can our computers spy for us, but not for us, right? It, mm. it spies for commercial reasons. Why can our why can our systems not know when I first looked at something? You know, why like even my Amazon browsing history? Ah, I you know I looked at it on Amazon. What, what books have I looked at? You know, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, the the problem one of the problems associated with that is of course it, it's kind of thing you go and look at that book and they say oh that thing on a completely unrelated subject which happened to catch your eye, which you then looked at, and then you get mailed to death about, do you want to buy books on this subject? No, I just happened to see something interesting and I clicked on it for a moment. And I think it's quite difficult. That's one thing the computer's actually really bad at, is guessing whether I looked at it, in a sense, accidentally or on a sideways thing, or whether I deliberately opened it. Um, and that inability causes a massive amount of noise around that kind of recall in systems. So actually opening something digitally is is a problem we need to get around because it's actually a really poor record of our actual attentive use deliberate use of something uh, i don't suggest it's easy but i i know it's a problem now um i'm always amazed when i look back through my web history over several days and think oh i'm sure i'll find what, what was i looking at there you know um clearly i'd seen something and followed down another rabbit hole in a separate tab but that just shows how actually how hard it is to get back to the thing you know, to answer the, the sort of classic, you know, give me that piece of paper I had in my hand two days ago, which is what we're always trying to do. Brendan. But what is the appetite in the group uh, here? Is it mostly for talking about these ideas or for talking about maybe something to do? Sorry, uh, Brendan, I didn't see you had your hand up. No, you're okay. I'm, I'm having a blast. Uh, admittedly, I am the, the least uh, tenured member of this group, but it's very cool to hear your kind of insights and musings on a, a number of different topics that, that tie back to our daily life and how we integrate uh, technology. Um, and I, I can come back to my point. No, 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 please do, do make your point. But I just uh, want to have that general thing up. Yeah, so Mark, I, I don't know if you're familiar um, and admittedly I'm not a abundantly familiar with it, uh, but the idea of intent-based uh, search for um, exploratory Google searches. There's been a decent amount of research here on some new technology in this field that is kind of affording people more of a you know, integrated visualization that they can modify as they are searching alongside mm -hmm. you know, a topic they're unfamiliar with. And there's probably a nugget in there that yeah. pieces back to the opening you know, something deliberately and diving deeper down a rabbit hole. Um, that I, I'm kind of keen on. I, I, I don't know exactly where that goes, but it feels like there's a, a finding. Yeah, I think so. And there's a, there's a degree of the, the frustration is, of course, whilst you're doing that, there's also the side quest you went on that is also serendipitous because you might find, well, I'm never going to buy one of those that lives in a different part of your mind before you come back to the thing that you were doing at the time. But I, no, I think you're right. I mean, Making those sort of things easier, I'm conscious people's hand hand up, I, I think would be massively useful. Peter. Okay, another kind of search that I really wish I had an effective means of doing would be searching for people. You can always find the famous people and everybody wants to get into here for 20 minutes or to talk to Ted if they can get a hold of them, but the people who aren't famous yet, but who are doing the kinds of things that I'm doing, who I haven't been lucky enough to wind up in a meeting with through serendipity yet. So who's been reading the same sorts of things that famous person X has been reading? Who's going to be the next Vint who's still in grad school now, who no one knows about yet, but who's been reading the right kinds of things based upon you know, a profile of what I think are important things to be researching, 
who's on this particular topic. They might not have been published yet because again, I wanna get and find the grad students and maybe even reaching down as far as undergrad for really outstanding people. Who's looking at the stuff? Who's thinking about the same problems? Who's using the same tools possibly? So if there was some sort of a search and LinkedIn isn't very useful at all for that because it's just presenting final polished CVs and it doesn't give me an indication of what people are passionate about, what issues they care about, what tooling they use. Sometimes we'll get that. I mean, you'll see a list of a programming language or something, but that's not really telling me it's the kind of granularity that would be useful. You know, who's basically the next Doug Engelbart out there that's trying to build a system that we don't know even exists? How do we find them or make it easy for them to find us in the reverse direction? We still are focused on privacy. We don't think about what if I want to be found? We worry about the problem of, I don't want to be found. I want to erase what you know about me. But what if I want to be discovered by a certain kind of a profile of person? How can we make it easier for them to find us as opposed to us trying to find them? Uh, for instance, it's probably a problem also on the funding side of things. Um, everybody knows that Elon could write them a check that would make their dream come true. Now, we can presume that there are some things that Elon cares about and that he might even have a team whose job is to try to find people with interesting projects that are worth his backing, but how do we make it easy for them to find us? You know, so sort of a person matching, but a person matching through literature and through searches and issues. I'll take my hand down now. If I had, if I had $15 million to spend, I still wouldn't spend it on that. It is a huge, it is an important issue, but um, sorry, Adam, I see you have your hand up, but I, there are some companies working on aspects of this. Obviously, LinkedIn is trying to do it for business and so on. But from my own experience of who is actually productive versus who is just busy, it's really, really hard to tell. It's, you know, I think this, it is more almost how to improve Twitter. But anyway, yeah, Adam. No, in a way, this forum is uh, me being here is doing that signaling that I'm interested in certain topics that, uh, um, and even if some of the discussions are not uh, my main interests or, uh, or, uh, or if they are, uh, it's good to be here to just be seen and show things and we, we may form subgroups of this community community for whatever it is, metadata, privacy, or text in other uh, preservation. And there are so many aspects to text. So just by being here and uh, it's a kind of a signaling. Um, and personally, the, uh, going back to the temporal aspects of, of time, it's kind of the constant problem of, uh, of my, my work to how to bring time, how to make time visible because it's in everything. It's a sequencing of, of letters, it's a order or arguments in a, in, a, in a text piece. It's the replies that Frodo has been talking about, how you, the, the document discourse back and forth, or yeah, back and forth, but it's forward in time. How do you put them? How do you do this graphically? Uh, because usually the, the traditional, especially by, among computer, very computer literate people and programmers, they, they have, have usually many of them have quite good memory or have trained that part so they can keep many things in their head. Mm -hmm. um, that's why they have code for you. You don't see, you see variables and you see functions and they refer to each other, but you have to see all the, you have to keep those connections in your head. You don't see it, you don't really see it visually. Um, and that has spilled over to to maybe too many computer systems where web pages pages are completely replaced when you click a link the the trail is not there and uh, so you can't really see the temporal connection from you working uh, being on one page and being on the next page and uh, and uh, and uh, if we look at all the social media things where uh, at one point, the direction was that the latest thing was at the bottom of the page because that followed the text direction that uh, you started. You, but now we have a very strange temporal uh, thing where where text starts going left to right in English and Western languages uh, and then going line by line down. But the new reply comes above or sometimes it comes below. Uh, and in some system, it comes to the right, 
a reply. So, so nailing down um, the temporal aspects, uh, the sequencing of thing, and also the more temporal, like, um, it, it's, it's a really hard problem, and it's really, really useful to do that work, because I think uh, making time visible in a two dimensional, maybe even a three dimensional space is a, is a very worthwhile project. And uh, I, w I fight with that every day. If you have a clipboard and a clipboard history, how do you display that history? Do you stack things on top? Yeah, there is also the notion of stacking things on top in different ways, that the things on top is the latest way, kind of overlapping windows. The, the latest open application in a desktop is on top. So it's a kind of a pile of leaves or papers. So there are many ways of stacking things or organizing things that represent time and to having a coherent way or, or as coherent as possible is not always possible to do to and also showing di different versions of documents in, in time. How do you do that on the Mac? You have this uh, three dynam dimensional. Um, yeah, and I even though it's cool, it's not usable to me in, in not very usable. Uh, so uh, having things more side by side for comparison, I, that, that's a Ted Nelson, what is it, his parallel documents. Uh, um, but it. how do you actually do that? It's really, this is a real explorative process that, that we could do in code and in PowerPoints and in, uh, in many ways and uh, in discussion, because there are so many temporal aspects that we need to nail a few down. Down, I think, and also with the timeline, I did a horizontal timeline for the papers of hypertext that visualization prototype that is horizontal. But it, as we kind of noticed immediately, is that documents and abstracts go up, uh, top to bottom. It's kind of a scrolling on the other way, forming a, a T shape on the screen. Mm -hmm. It's not the efficient use of time, so maybe the timeline should be, yeah top to bottom as well again but that also brings problems it's a timeline left to right is a bit more balanced uh, with the kind of stacks we have having it left to right will make it uh, like a jagged uh, maybe graphically unpleasing thing uh, there are so many dimensions to time that i really find fasc fascinating to um um yeah, <laughs> that was a long rant about many things or a long um, that I struggled with. I don't have the solutions, here, but uh, uh, it could be worth exploring this. The only way to explore it, I think, is to try to build it. And to build it, you have to get the data. And that's a problem. I mean, kind of obvious things like um, if the documents are written by any of you guys, show me your face in little icon form instead. You know, it's much easier. But then, I mean, look at Mark Anderson and Adam right now. You're not exactly iconic in placement. Brendan and Peter are. You know, Peter has a photograph. You know, one thing that may be very useful just to be able to build this stack is to have an app that does a basic scan of your face so you have it cleanly. Hardly any academics give a monkeys about how they look on different devices. You know, their profile pictures are, quite, are crap. You know, when, whenever there's a demo, it's always a black, blank background, it's always this, but there's so many wonderful pieces of visualization we can put in, but how do we actually get to them? Yeah, Mark. Yes, I, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting to feel senior enough that I can revert to having an unstyled page in Times Roman with no styling at all, which is sort of when you peaked out on the web circuit. I think. Times Roman is pretty you just, stylish. You don't have yeah. to care anymore. Times Roman is very stylish. <laughs> But um, <clears throat> yeah, now, but anyway, a couple of things that occurred to me. So one is thinking back to what uh, what made stick my hand up first was what Peter was talking about about interconnecting. Is I mean, for me, there's a, there's a special library stack in in in, in Hades for the librarians who tell you go and look at the most cited stuff. I mean, I don't want that blather. I almost want you know show me nothing that's been cited more than this many times. Everyone knows about that stuff. I'm going to learn nothing from it because I've, I, I will absorb that through the, the generalities. What's really interesting are the things that, you know, are less discovered. And, and this is one of the problems about, I'm thinking, how do we teach ourselves to be better? It's a metadata problem. How do we become better recorders of things? So, you know, I think back to the, the stuff, well, it's not fully analyzed yet, but the data set that we've used for Adam's visualizations, the keywords in that, <clears throat> I think 60% of them have one occurrence. 
So they're effectively useless, except in, this, in the different case where you absolutely want to find that thing. But if you didn't know what that thing was, it's, use, it's useless. For, and then at the other end, everyone's used about 10 terms. There are actually very few useful things that allow you to pick your way and say, oh, what are the things in this area? Um, which is why when I haven't said, well, you know, where are the papers say on spatial, spatial hypertext? The answer is, oh, I'll have to go, I'll, I will have to go away and put that in because it doesn't exist. Nobody. So the, 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 the people working in that domain think it's not relevant to record. The authors don't think it's relevant to record. And I find that interesting. Um, it's partly because we've got this acutus log rolling thing of, of citation and publish or die, which I think is doing uh, knowledge work absolutely no good at all. Um, uh, and just one other separate thing <laughs> that came to mind as I was listening to Adam is the fact that, yes, we do think about sort of, you know, diagrams where the time runs across the page or up or down or something. And I'm thinking, but actually, if you think about more fluid um, illustration spaces, is think about the subject where somebody just reinvents the wheel. Well, it'd be really nice to sort of almost take, take the timeline, lay it back across itself in an enormous loop and say, right, well, what's all the stuff in between a complete waste of time? And do really interesting and, and, and sort of, you know, again, so this is real explorational stuff where you start, you, you use events to create juxtapositions which otherwise don't occur. Um, and having something like a timeline for the sort of organization strikes me as often much richer. Things generally don't get uninvented. They get forgotten about, or they get not known about, or, they, or they're never known in the first place, but they don't generally get uninvented. Um, they may be discarded as no longer pertinent because a better thing has come along. Um, you know, you might have, instead of, you know, you had a horseless carriage rather than a horse-drawn carriage, um, <clears throat> leaving aside the fossil fuels for a moment. But, you know, so you probably didn't want the horse-drawn cart because it wasn't as effective for the thing you were doing. But otherwise, there are there are these things where we keep, cranky, we keep reinventing the wheel. We, we sort of knew this. So what did we miss at this point? I'm finding this at the moment because I'm pre prepping um, a talk on microcosm for uh, Hypertext so two, week, two weeks' time. Uh, and looking at the stuff that, gosh, we did this back at the dawn of the web, and we're still not doing it properly now. And it's just been sitting there, you know, rusting in the long grass. Um, so that's the sort of thing that keeps me in, engaged in this, is thinking, how do we better record, how do, how do we make it easy, easier for us to record these moments of sort of insights overreaching, but perhaps we could say potential insight. This is something I think might be of note, not necessarily to me, but somebody else who's looking at this later. So, you know, don't rush past this window without looking in it. You might just find something interesting. Peter. Peter. Did you put Peter to sleep? Possibly. It's an art, you see. <laughs> Well, oh, I'm sorry, the phone rang and I muted myself and I forgot to unmute. I just gave a, I'm sorry you guys missed it. It was just the most brilliant speech and analysis that anyone had done in the last 20 years and it's all gone now. Sorry about that. Peter, uh, if you had recorded it, like we're talking about, this would not be an issue. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so what I'd like to be able to find are the books in the collection that are periodically of interest to people. Something that, you know, maybe every three or four years someone borrows and then they borrow it again, or they've gone off and bought their own personal copy because it's not necessarily the most popular thing, but it was something that someone really felt was important. And in that respect, it'd be kind of nice if the library catalog could let you initiate a purchase of a personal book from the catalog so that the catalog would be aware that you'd gone off and you'd actually bought this book so that you could have it instead of saying, oh, gee, he only looked at the book once and he put it back on the shelf. And it wasn't that he put it back on the shelf once because the book wasn't important. He put it back on the shelf because it was so important. He bought his own copy and had it flying in. So he'd have it permanently starting a few days later. And we have no way at the moment to distinguish between the looked at it once and threw it back because it wasn't good and looked at it once and made it part of his personal library as a result of having looked at it briefly once. So I think that would be a very useful affordance to have. Um, also, I think a lot 
about adding tags to things. I find tagging incredibly frustrating because I have this huge sea of potential tags. And what I want is some sort of an inverse parser or something that will allow me to indicate categories just by like mousing over, maybe not even needing to click, just hover over a category for a few seconds and then have that expand to subcategories and have maybe functional variants so that it could be, you know, show me more like this. And then another category of possible tags could be relationships related to entities of the type that I was just over. So then I could move to a relationship and then move through the network, basically building up a grammatically significant multi-word identifier as opposed to just having disconnected tags. So it'd be sort of an inverse parser and Chris Crawford came up with an idea of that for video games and computer games a while back. And he actually has like a blog post somewhere on building inverse parsers, but they were kind of awkward interfaces. What I'd want is some sort of a fluid system again, where I could just be mousing over, use the amount of time I'm hovering to control. So I'm not having to explicitly click to drill down through a menu manually. It'd be more like flying through an information space, like Apple's old Project X oodles ago in the Mac 2 era. And it was you know one of the many projects named Project X, but it was like a 3D fly through of tags and web browser bookmarks that you can navigate through spatially. So this would be sort of flying through the potential grammar tree with new levels of possibilities expanding at each level. And I haven't seen any interface like that. I'd like to build it at some point. I'm not quite sure how to accomplish it, but it's one of those projects for when I find the right tool to make it feasible to build this kind of a project. And I don't know whether you guys have anything like it, but I have like a set of things. If I can find the right tool to make it feasible to do this, I wanna do this. And I have a few of them sort of sitting on the back burner in the back of my head sort of half crystallized visions of potential tooling, but the components that I need to build them aren't all there just yet. I'll deal with it. Oh, sorry, I I, uh, I was speaking to people's off, but an, an interesting point thinking to um, Peter's thing is that one of the things that I like in Adam's visualization is this way of um, visually so instead of using a sort of a zoom effect as people do, it's it's the fading. Now there are all sorts of issues. It needs it doesn't it's not going to work on a phone. It's not great if you don't have great eyesight and things. But nonetheless, parking those issues for a moment, it's I really like that idea. So things fade into or out of um, existence around the thing you're looking at. So rather than sort of a drill down thing which tends to force us or, or, or laziness makes us um, implement as a hierarchy, thus creating structures and relationships we never intended. The idea of just having these things that have some degree of affinity or, or you know, in whatever the relation of the, the sort of query in the looser sense of the word that you've done, all these things have a broad um, relevance and being able to just dial some of them back or bring some out as you basically play with relationships, but importantly, without creating formal relationships. Right, and the final result would sort of be the sequence of things that you'd been focused on laid out as a linear result at the end of the day when you finally, finally reach the final level that you were going to. So, you know, you'd know that first we were hovering over this, then we moved off to look at relationships, then we moved off to look at reference, then we moved off to this class of reference, and that could be sort of spelled out, and that would be the grammatical sentence in the grammar describing your information space. Yeah. But you wouldn't have had to build it by consulting a formal grammar or look at it, be sort of a discover it as you weave your way through. And some productions could be repeated at different levels. Yeah. And certainly... that doesn't work with a hierarchical menu because the hierarchical menu presumes that there was one canonical path through and it has to know ahead of time how many times you're expanding. This is sort of like a lazy menu where you'd just be adding new layers as you focused on new things as opposed to having it all built out and structured ahead of time and represented in HTML as a pre-existing outline structure. Well, that's been my reflection on sort of watching 14 odd years of people using Tinderbox maps. The people who don't draw lines between the objects on the map, I think, get more out of their maps, which seems counterintuitive. 
But, you know, the moment you draw a line, you're, you're suddenly privileging two things more than everything else. And you're creating a relationship you probably didn't intend to because there's a sense that the line only goes one way, um, even if, again, you didn't mean it. Whereas we're quite adept in our mind's eye of saying, oh, look, those two things are closer together than those two things, or they're a different color or a different shape or whatever. Don't need lines. We just removed the ability to draw lines and concept mapping and author. Hmm. Oh, another question. When you, um, yeah. yeah. Have any of you guys ever heard of integral theory? Heard of it. It has like a four quadrant approach um, where things related to yourself internally are in the upper left quadrant. Um, things related to your organization internally with this culture would be in the lower left quadrant. Then the upper right quadrant would represent, um, I'm a little bit fuzzy off the top of my head, but I saw this interesting formalism a while back. If I can find a link, I'll feed it to you through email. But it could be an interesting way of organizing. Yeah. Um... When you talked about uh, the whole lines thing, Mark, it brings me back to the whole focus. Everything we're doing for Author 7.5 is basically changing vocabulary. So we're talking about defining and how you deal with defined, uh, defined concepts. So, you know, if we're going to choose how to do timelines and representations, we have to choose uh, if we're going to have anything be um, kind of primary objects. One of the problems, of course, if we're talking about documents or books is you have time, title, publisher, author, you know, what, what is the essence? You know, what we're doing is none of those. It's concept where the books are what backs that up or refers to it so that the, the primary unit is the thing that you have in your head, hopefully. And also you, you can sort of ban things and it doesn't, you know, it might be different. So, for instance, you might have your um, citations stuck or uh, stuck along a, a publishing date timeline and you might put essentially you know the pros and the cons and the just generally interesting ones in different columns giving you an instant sense without having to draw any lines anywhere of of what they mean or as I was sort of discussing on chat earlier about the, the thing I'm looking at you know sort of history of citation indexing and things is I'm thinking this thing has a timeline then it's useless so it should be that anything of note in the book, certainly in the paper book, should say C timeline. And in the timeline, it should link back to C page 42. Obviously, in a digital thing, it would just be a straight link. So you can jump backwards and forwards because oh. often, often when you're in the detail of the subject, you know, the paper you're writing an author or something, there's, there's lots of detail and you can't see the wood for the tree. So being able to jump out into your, your, um, your concept map or into something like a timeline, is actually very rewarding if <clears throat> if you bother to populate it and being able to strand things out. So it might be, you know, here are the here are the European thinkers, here are the African thinkers, um, or you know, here are the people who are English speaking, here are the people who speak Japanese, or whatever. We don't have the strand you want, um, and you can still do that against a primary axis like time. And right. I, I can imagine you might find others as well, but. Well, Mark, in the book, you can do that on a basic level. Yeah. If you come across, let's say, Windows 10 or whatever it might be, select it, Command F, if you're on reader. Mm. If it is in the timeline, which it should be, that will be shown at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. So it, it's the beginning attempt at doing, you know, different views of that. But Sure. I mean, I'd love what I'd love to do is to go back and sort of resection the um, first feature of text data. I mean, I've just got time at the moment, but to go back and, and sort of basically do some of this tagging, as I sort of alluded to earlier with this other data set, of sort of saying, what if, is this person talking about typography? Are they talking about citation? Are they talking about, uh, you know, whatever? Um, so that I can see, right, where, where, does, where do these strands run through this? So what are the what are the what is the thinking that we have represented here um, on these topics? Uh, and it might be interesting again, we have because we have a timeline, you can then lay those back to those, and you could have past historical events that feed to this subject area. Okay, so all these people are talking about this. 
but no one's act, nothing seemingly significant in that area has happened since 1600. Um, you know, I give you, yeah. might give you. Well, there's concern. a lot of editorializing there, Mark, which I think is good, and I think that needs to be clear, though. So there, there should be like an, an editorial view by you, but. Um, on a completely different note, for a reason, who here has been on TikTok? Not necessarily posted, but actually spent some time viewing TikToks. What is it? It's really fascinating. And, sorry, I'll actually show you a little bit because I think it's relevant. So, how many just... guys have you slept with? Okay, well, typical uh, no. one, right? Come on, I just, I really want to know. So, very often, it's just kind of comedy, they ask a question, it's a bit ridiculous. But the interaction is, you, you slide up. Right? Th that's all it is. You, you just go through and there's cute stuff, sexy stuff, business stuff, whatever. A lot of it's comedy, but you know, sometimes it's really actually quite shocking. You know, you go on there and because it's very easy to add texts. Right, and they do just like you got asked so and so. Oh, this is really interesting. Just listen to the music and see her movements. Okay, this is a thing on TikTok. Questions I get asked when being a single mother. Question. Right. So. There's another thing that I want to highlight, and that is some of them are live. You go through, and suddenly that person is live. You can just tap, and you're actually in the live feed. And that person may be doing laundry or whatever. It's such an intimate experience. And there are many jokes, but don't ever watch it. Go on TikTok if you want to relax. Some, you know, one of the stories was, um, or, or somebody I saw was, you know, the woman, she's 26 years old. She found her husband dead. She has two kids. To deal with her PTSD, she puts all her emotions on TikTok, you know, like talking to a stranger kind of thing. And, it's just, and then you can swipe to the side, and then there's the history of whatever that person has posted. There's a lot of it. It is such an intimate medium. You can do live things on Facebook and videos and all of that. And of course, you can do mixed things. But the way they do it on TikTok, it's because my cousin's son, he is a bit of a TikToker in Norway, so I decided I had to try it. It's really fascinating. And that little song, and when she did all this weird stuff, I have no clue what that is. But you know, all the the question and answer is always on the screen. So the fact that I have to do this hand thing and all of that has nothing to do with the answers. It's not like this is yes or no. But you, you scroll through, there is a completely different level of human intimacy that I've seen anywhere else. Partly because of suddenly there's a live person in that stream, right? It's almost the opposite of text. It's almost the opposite of the intellectual stuff we're talking about. But I think it's provocative enough to to add to our interactions brain box. You know what, what I mean? What does it? I, the thing is, I, I I sort of you know because people keep sending me stuff. But I mean, I I, I I'm always I, you know, I don't want to disparage it because if nothing else, it's often quite a, you know it's a, it's been put together with a degree of artistry, which is sort of fine. But I'm always left thinking. Yep, so that's another 15 seconds of my life I don't get back. Okay. I don't, but, but, I don't uh, actually okay. sort of see what you get from it. Okay, that is a comment that could be directed at any media in the history of mankind. Sure, but I mean, I'm asking it because no, 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 you were saying TikTok. So I was wondering, why is this one not like another thing where I well, really don't... That's, that's what I'm trying to explain, the differences. The difference, one TikTok, if I send you one TikTok via email or something, and you watch that one TikTok, it's not that different. What, what is different and is really the interaction. Is, you know, that ever scrolling thing of full screen video in your face, very often with text. Sometimes it's very badly acted jokes. You know, like a child says, mom, can I have $20? No, what do you think? I'm made of money. Isn't that what mom stands for? Made of money. You know, when you say uh, full uh, screen, though, you're assuming you're watching it on a phone. It, I'm seeing the only on a phone. It, it, monitors, it, it, which is my normal consuming. It's uh, only it's on a phone. It's only okay. on a phone. This is why I don't see it then, because I don't use a phone very much. No, no but the, the, the thing is, the, the devices really do shape the medium, right? So TikTok on a laptop would be a very different thing. 
And I'm, I'm not saying we should all run out and spend hours on TikTok, but I am saying it, it's worth actually going, spending time with it because it, it is the interaction. It, it is the surprise. It is the going up. It, you know, it, it is the, okay, so here's someone who's actually live. My internet connection is, you know, I'm just find something that's different. But, but is it not digitized fridge art? Is it not what? Digitized fridge art. You know, kiddies bring stuff back from school. You put it proudly on the fridge, and then and then the next day you put another thing in front of it. It's not that it's no, with it's that not, merit, but no, it doesn't no, have any not. substance. No, it's not. And and for you to say that someone's expression is without substance is, I think, more reflection on you than it is on them, because. And this is why I'm saying it is something to experience because, you know, most movies are shit. Most songs are shit. What, what is that? There's the law, some kind of law that everything in any field is shit. Most philosophy is shit, right? Most TikTok is shit. But the thing that's interesting about it, it really is the interaction. Because when I came across that woman with PTSD because her, she found her husband dead, she's got two kids, pretty young woman, 26 years old. Fuck, you know, and then I go side and then all her stories are there. So yes, it's told in snippets, you know, maybe like Twitter. Some are stupid, some are funny, and some, you know, one of the women on her was, what's it like being in prison? Really? What? She looks very young. And then you go to the other ones and you see the pictures of her as a, as she calls herself, a drugged out whore, right? That's what she was. And you see her life come through, how she's changed, how she's got herself together, whatever. It comes in a completely different kind of bite size. So is 90% of TikTok nonsense? Absolutely. But if we're trying to find really new ways of doing tech stuff and knowledge stuff to dip in and out of this stuff, I mean, it's just a bit like, eh? It's not ex mind expanding like this, but it's a bit mind expanding like, huh? Like, huh? You know, like little things. Like Snapchat, I still don't understand. I've tried it. I don't get it at all. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Vern. Um, yeah, imagine that this conversation was asynchronous, that uh, you could, uh, that it was kind of a horizontal uh, tree that you could, um, that you could post short videos and the things we have in chat. Now the chat is kind of a timeline that is completely separate. But uh, imagine that uh, someone says something interesting and you come up with a good idea for it, but 50 minutes later and you feel that it's not the moment anymore. Sometimes, or often I feel that here, someone else uh, or the, the conversation takes a different direction. I feel bad about derailing it or going back again and so on. Imagine that we had short, that we had the opportunity to either add more things to a live conversation that someone else would chip in later on, uh, comment on a specific timeline with video and with text and with links and with the full, um, yeah, the full, everything that we want to put in there. And often we want to put, uh, we want to put an image on something, either we go full screen or we do maybe as I did last time, put it on my video. But it's still, it's still, it's not an object object you can take with you in many cases. So there are ways of having good discussion, not just TikTok uh, entertainment or uh, or uh, the heartbreaking stories, but also doing uh, high quality. This is this happens a lot. Okay, so the guy on the left or right or whatever way you're looking he is one of the top TikTokers in the world, right? He has never said a single word. But what he usually does is, is close to what you're saying. The, vid the other video is something someone else has made. So it literally is a comment on that video, right? So this is more joking thing. They do something fancy, he does something simple. But to have the ability to, to easily cite snippets like that, like you're saying, is really, really useful. If we do the thing of recording these talks, being able to highlight bits, and then refer to that later with another video, uh, what you're talking about, and to have a text transcribed for searchability and citing. That would be wonderful, Adam. Yeah, the, the, because I, the, I went on a, a tangent here, but I, when Peter told about Navi flying through the, the tags to find the right stuff, uh, I remembered um, a research prototype, a research system for disabled, some sort of a very, uh, yeah, where you had to, uh, 
manually enter or manually yeah enter text through a tube bl blowing and you can only blow up and down or something suck or blow and uh, it changed the direction of where you went into uh, for characters you went uh, through words you flew up and down for character by character to the right word can you uh, do you, uh, mm -hmm. um, and I remember that that system was very very interesting because I thought uh, it would uh, relate to text entry, especially on touch devices, where it could be predictive and uh, suggest things, but suggest many things, not just as a uh, autocorrect things on top of uh, your keyboard, your regular QWERTY touch key keyboard, but actually predicting or uh, suggesting things. Uh, um, but guys, for you and uh, yeah. so, but uh, what I wanted to say is that I wanted to find this link and post it for Peter to see it, um, but I, it's hard to post it in time here. I want to post it to Peter, but also with a timestamp so he can find it. So it's relevant to that discussion we had back uh, back then. Um, um, so I'm with you, Frode. We can take some of the interactions, even though they. Uh, we may view it as childish or uh, yeah, entertainment or distractions. Uh, many of the interactions are really, 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 really good. I, I think touch interfaces and computer games and many of the systems there are way better than what we have with, with uh, our text editors. So we should really be open to at least uh, uh, stealing the interfaces for many of those uh, things because they are way ahead. Uh, computer games, for example, you need to have split second reaction times and you need to do things very fast and, very, and with high precision to in, in order to win. I'll see you on Battlefield later tonight. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but it's very good too. And my, many of my inspirations come from from uh, uh, computer games. I think it's uh, very good. It's it starts at computer games, goes to uh, cool interfaces, and then slowly w making its way down to uh, business software and then maybe and then into government and uh, education and uh, finally at the library uh, yes. yeah, uh, uh, Brendan but just a, a, a quick little thing if we manage to do this video type stuff you're talking about and tie it to text so it can easily be cited and integrate into the other things that could be an amazingly powerful bridge because otherwise it'll, it'll just be another app with a cutesy little thing anyway uh, uh, Brendan yeah there's a great dynamic to that entire aspect. Uh, I just had my hand up for about a minute and there were, during the time that you were talking, uh, there were like three other things that I wanted to list out. And the affordance of, uh, you know, a, a non-linear sharing tool within a group conversation, especially when we're in a recorded environment like this, or it's a video environment where five of us can't talk over each other at once, is so important to be able to share ideas that can trigger for other people. Um, that's pretty much the most unique thing that I've, that I can think of with regards to like providing a nugget of insight to someone else. It doesn't come in that exact moment. I've been jotting notes this whole time while you were, you know, typing away earlier. I'm thinking, what is Adam writing about? Cause this is really fascinating until he's very interested in this. And those things often just get left, left behind unless I'm cognizant enough to note it, to then share it at the right time and to bring it back up. Um, and in all honesty, it wouldn't be searchable by any of you if we didn't discuss it here in this moment. So uh, yeah, there's a, there's a huge opportunity there with the mm -hmm. the environment of a digital meeting. A sort uh, of visual chat. Tools. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, yes, a, a sort of, because we have a chat window, but a visual chat window, there's just basically either picture of videos, but, but stuff that is inherently non-textual is something missing in this environment. Yeah, there's definitely the piece of, I think that the core problem for me is that, that temporal aspect of not being able to latch on to what Adam was saying right there and jot in a note um, and, and come back to that same point where he has okay. spoken something that triggered a thought for him. Let's just build it because the, the number one thing we would have to do for such a system is for time to be known. Sorry, I'm just trying to get in. What's up, Adam? But that's a massive problem, Frodo, or massive it's, challenge, maybe even more massive no, than... I'll tell you why it's 
it's if you record video locally you can time code every single frame if you want mm. right and you upload that to youtube or whatever but you give it haha let's call it visual meta right you explain in there this was uploaded at x time so the offset from when it was actually recorded rather than uploaded is this and that so that a player can re, re pull it back out right you see that that's the crazy thing to record a whole hour or two hour meeting on a normal laptop today is fine the fact that it's massive data is fine right and record it with time spam for the audio and then link back and forth and make this accessible in normal citations um so brendan can after this he can choose to send his highlights of this talk plus his extra bits that we can then as long as we have it yeah yeah but it's not upload it's not storing the video it's not even marking the times because they they are two maybe yeah one two timestamps where when it started when it ended and maybe an offset three times but uh, but uh, what i'm talking about is a kind of the integration the interface that puts it together not making it i'm sure we can make it a text file containing all the information uh, or a pdf uh, will vision meta containing that information that is the easy part but putting it all together so we will actually bother to or usable enough that we will use it so not just recording it but bringing it, bringing the interface from bringing it back and putting it together but, all but the, if, uh, if we have a method of describing the time bit which of course will be a huge thing in itself and if it has enough fuzziness then for those of us who chose to record it ourselves and have it on our own hard drive let's say we get a native speed and native everything but for someone else who may choose not to do that it may be a little bit laggy as youtube or whatever is dragged into those bits and it may not fit perfectly but it'll be quite close you know in this you know how you can have two bits of video you can see that they record at the same time just by making the waveform fits you know i'm, I'm sure we're getting closer to um, to things with that Often it's not video that you need. It's actually often just a static graphic. is 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 more explanatory than the words. The trouble is, I mean, watching the video actually takes more cognitive effort and takes you away from other things. You can actually take a picture in your sort of peripheral vision, pick up a lot straight from it. So certainly being able to have literally, I said the one disappointment about, for instance, Zoom chat is if you put an image in it, it doesn't show the image. It makes someone download it now i'm sure there are all sorts of consent issues things and that but leaving that aside it would be much more useful if if you want to show someone a picture you just put it in the chat and it showed to all the participants for instance that's a, that's a strong point i mean i'm guessing specifically brendan and adam because you both talked about adding things later if what you have is essentially an audio stream you have a let's say mm -hmm. a still picture of this mm -hmm but you have the text transcript really easily accessible and you can see the bits that during the call, your highlight is be important. Do a couple of selections, click a couple of things, share it with us. And if we want to, because it's also going on YouTube, we can choose to pull it in at a time. If we feel that that's relevant because someone was really lively or something happened, it doesn't have to be the core. Wouldn't chances be that going back to this would actually be just reading the text most of the time? Yeah, there could be. An audio soundbite um, that, that, that could accompany. Uh, there's there's a lot in like the intonation that I think it, it might need to carry along. But video, I don't know that it's necessary unless it would be a, uh, a demo. If Adam's showing off something that he's designed, then that's essential. Uh, that's a, a piece Good of point. context that's necessary. Screen Screen sharing should be tagged and recorded and shared differently. Yes, no question. That's a good point. And also, I don't know where if uh, transcribe if if you transcribe me it would be a very bad experience because i i have half finished sentences i convey a lot more with other uh, with my expressions and tone than <laughs> with actual words maybe so uh, so i think it will for some people some people really think and then construct a full readable sentence I'm not one of the, uh, those people, and I think many are not. So uh, tra uh, transcribing everyone may not be the right medium to uh, to understand them. 
I agree with that, but it depends on what we mean by the end product. So the end product for something the way that I view it would be to share with each other and also the rest of the yeah. wider community, right? So if we have a basic document that is basic text, if there is something that some of us highlights, we should be able to not only, well, we should be able to annotate it. So it's like what Adam was saying here really was blah, blah, click here, or you know, you can click on the text to get the audio. Right. It, it is it is not to get the whole thing. It is to highlight a part of this. It's just a pointer in a way. Right? Yeah, it's so we have a, a, a nugget that you extract to to kind of allow other people to uh, you know kind of magnetize around. And if there is something that they want to discuss a little further, then that is your your node that you're you're using. So what's your intuition here? We have kind of a today we covered better calendars, better video chat or meetings, uh, and several others that I don't remember, but I remember that there were several others of so quite big projects. What, what, what's your feeling here? What, what, what should we as a community, because we can only do one thing or a half of one thing maybe, uh, or lots of small prototypes, but then it's more kind of PowerPoints and minimal prototypes to just show the diversity or put the ideas out there. But I think there are many ideas out there and that is what people have been doing for the decades. Many research prototypes and uh, lab things uh, or individual weekend projects that are put out there and um, uh, and very few of them may actually made into something that you could keep and use over time. So uh, what's, what's your thoughts? Shall we go alphabetically and start with Brendan? Because we're going sure. first name Mark, not last name. Mark. Yeah, I think that I always think of personal problems that I have, and I think about like my my natural kind of inclinations towards things. Um, and as mentioned, I think out loud. That's how I work best, and it doesn't always come out best right away. As I'm talking right now, I'm I'm piecing through the the core element that I want to get to. But eventually, I think I'm going to get there. It's just kind of meandering down the river. So I really love the concept of trying to tinker around with something that would notate, or I suppose it's, it's transcribed so that we can annotate uh, in a nonlinear format on the, the text that, that comes out of our conversations. Because I have a serious problem where I'm in a meeting with you guys. You're saying brilliant stuff over and over and I can't chime in at the right time, or as I'm starting to type in the chat, then I'm not paying attention to, to what's going on and I, I lose track. So that is uh, the, the strongest signal that I have internally, like the, the embodied cognition. Is like, I wanna solve that problem, that sounds cool. Mr. Anderson. Well, as regards this space, I mean, I, I think one of the one, one of the things is to find is to find a sort of a a simple <clears throat> method to sit atop some rather than remake the whole thing. Is is this sort of this is I just I I just had a great thought, or somebody else just said something really interesting, you know, just to stab on a, a very quick way that takes minimal attention away from the moment to just record a marker probably not immediate well perhaps at the time or just after basically for as a hook to go back and and extract something interesting to to adam's wider point i i'm i'm still very excited by the stuff um you showed us i can't remember it was on monday or last week the the visualization you did i i think there's some really interesting stuff to be done there as an exploration space um and I remain as fascinated as ever by the idea of exploring um, um, informational text through it with, with, a, with a temporal element to it. Peter? Well, I like doing the visualizations. Um, I really want to explore more on literate programming. And I think that's an area where there could be a lot of benefits and again, the tagging issue. There's no decent interface for tagging. It's great if you just have one or two tags, but what winds up happening, I throw everything into Devon Think3, and I literally have hundreds of tags, but those tags could be clustered at several levels, 
and there should be a clean way to navigate through them. And instead, I have to start typing enough of the tag for the predictive spell check autocorrect suggests the rest of the tag. And this is okay, except when I have multi-word tags, because then I have to type far enough into the tag to hit a space for it to realize that, oh, I only meant the first word. I didn't want the entire tag. So the typing experience is a very frustrating way of entering a number of tags efficiently. It just doesn't work well. I want to have some sort of a little widget. And this also comes in with version control. Uh, the latest version control software allows you to basically be independently editing different aspects of a document, provided that the changes that are being made in a given patch aren't conflicting with previous changes. So let's say I'm going in and I'm adding spelling corrections to a document. That's one kind of a task. And you could take all of those patches corresponding to spell edits and combine them into a single maintenance patch. Uh, systems like Darks and Pijul support that sort of thing. And that makes looking at revision tracking histories much cleaner because I don't want to track the individual edits to the point of every time I had to scroll and shift from one line of text to another line, that's creating a new edit. I want to be batching edits conceptually. And the logical way to do that would be to have some sort of a tagging widget sitting on the screen by the side of my editor so that I could tell it, now I'm switching to a spell correction task. Now I'm switching to an add a comment task so that I could then filter on that when looking at the revisions and not see all of the stuff that I don't care about. What I get now is 10 million patches of you know every single diff in the document as I'm working on stuff. And I have to spend a lot of time manually naming patches and combining patches. So the low level engineering support is already there, but there's no user interface on top to make it useful. Yeah. Okay, my turn. I, I think you can only do stuff once you have the data. I, I, I don't think we can do th things uh, in, in general, you know. And that's, of course, what the um, uh, Mark Adam thing showed. And this is the reason why I'm pushing so hard for visual meta. When it comes to this, I think we should try to find a way to build a way to record our thing, the meeting here, a record in a useful way, like we talked about, so it knows when it was find a way on top of that to add annotations. It'll be like an edit decision list, maybe. I don't know. We, we need to have discussions around that. Once we have a little bit of data from a few conversations and we have the, in the right format for the right metadata and a, a way to share it, then we can start building some of these interactions. And I think something really, really useful can come out of it. I mean, one thing I would love to do down the line in my little neck of the woods is you cite a bit of this Put it in your author thing and it knows it's a special thing when you then export your pdf and you click on that citation it doesn't open up with just the reference stuff you can actually play the video or audio right there for that bit and if you want to play more it can go full screen or something i had video playing an author from day one we took it out because it just wasn't useful no one was reading an author but as long as we have a full knowledge journey so it doesn't just stay in its own little app. I mean, TikTok is great, but it literally is its own ecosystem. It's mostly just amusement. If we're going to do knowledge stuff, it has to go out. Mm. So I think none of those things were controversial in this group or anything, but I think we should just start figuring out a way to record and build this stuff. Anyway, we have to go for dinner with the neighbors today. Which is very amusing, so I'm afraid I have to go. Um, are you guys sticking around for a bit, or are we looking forward to Monday? Monday, I guess. Monday. I chose the wrong day. I'm now to update. I now have the only functioning Mac in the house. <laughs> so my, my, my evening is now getting everything working again. Ah, yes. Joy. Sounds like fun. All right, guys. Um, let's keep thinking, and maybe Monday we start a bit more focused on recording our meetings and making that a useful knowledge thing because it seems you know big companies do big things we're tiny and nothing so it means we can do simpler solutions that may actually be useful right yep indeed no too much focus is on the big data end of things yeah or having to have many layers of managers who need to have their stamp on this stuff you know do something yeah. simple useful yeah. somebody's gonna right. get paid right 
We're the mammals, they're the dinosaurs. So I almost said paid, but there must be a, something on the line. Anyway, talk to you later, guys. Have a good weekend. Yeah, uh, cheers. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye.